Welcome to a special repeater radio edition of Acid Horizon as part of their K-Punk Marathon in honor of the late, great Mark Fisher. Today, myself, Craig, Will, Matt, and Adam are joined by Repeater Radio's very own Graham Jones, host of the show Red Enlightenment. Today, we're going to be talking with Graham about Mark Fisher and the search for a materialist spirituality. Graham, welcome to Acid Horizon. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me on. Great. We have a lot of questions for you today. First, maybe you could talk about Red Enlightenment and some of the other work that you do. Okay, so uh, Red Enlightenment uh, podcast and soon to be a book as well. It will be coming out on repeater once I've once I finish the podcast. Going to try and convert it as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, Red Enlightenment on socialism, science, and spirituality is the kind of subtitle. So the kind of the thrust of the project is you know this kind of typical kind of critique of of the left. We we start off in our current kind of circumstances and how the left is not really being quite as successful as we really need it to be. And sort of looking at the different kind of scales and different sort of domains in which we're kind of struggling in on sort of individual, interpersonal, collective and global scales. What I sort of argue that differs perhaps from the typical critique and might ruffle some feathers is I argue that there is a sort of a spiritual dimension to what is missing on the left. Now, what I mean by spiritual, we can maybe go into a little bit later, but to begin with, sort of broadly, on all of these scales, and I'm drawing a little bit on on the late Michael Brooks for this sort of like practical kind of aspect, because he was very keen on the idea of sort of integrating spirituality into the left, even though yeah, he wasn't coming from a religious, sort of a traditionally religious perspective. He thought of himself as like a secular, scientific, socialist, materialist thinker. But he wanted to sort of engage with lots of different worldviews and lots of different sort of like um, ways of producing knowledge. And on all of these different scales, there are kind of ways that we can transform what the left is doing that, you know, it might be a bit of a contentious term, but you can think of it as as being spiritual. So on the global scale, which is one that Brooks was really interested in, you've got this, if we, if we need to be able to create sort of global movements against capitalism and climate change and things like this, which which really cannot be solved on a local level, then that means organizing alliances on a global level. And you're faced with this problem that the left does not really grapple with, that somewhere between 80 and 85% of people on the planet are religious, whereas the Western secular left is often virulently anti-religious. And that creates a huge organizing problem, a, a huge kind of practical problem. And so even just on the on the level of like education and empathy, even if we remain kind of staunchly secular, kind of, you know, don't even integrate any kind of spiritual practice of our own, we, at the very least, we need to have greater sort of like basically religious education and, and means of creating dialogue. But then as we kind of come down the scales, there are things like um, Brooks takes this idea, I think it's a term he takes from Martin Luther King, the, the idea of Machiavellian spirituality, the idea that spirituality can actually be a motivating force if it's done right. Uh, the, 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 the left tends to associate spirituality and religion with conservatism and, and ideological subservience and things like this. But obviously, if you look at liberation theology movements and, and things like this, and the civil rights movement in the 60s, you, know, you can see examples of where religious or, or broadly, more broadly spiritual discourses can have a really motivating effect and you know he, he was arguing about sort of being able to integrate more of this kind of thing regardless like i said it's not it's not an argument for everyone to become like christians or anything like that but again kind of coming like more more local in our smaller kind of organizing spaces both online and offline you know we can often find a lot of toxicity a lot of aggression basically just really bad vibes and trying to cultivate um, you know a, more of a sense of empathy of compassion and all these things without it being sort of fluffy liberalism and sort of just allowing people to be awful because oh, we love everyone trying to work out how we can navigate those different things and then finally on the on the core individual level our own mental health our own uh, ability to survive in what are often appear to be sort of crumbling empires and and you know all of the terrors that we can see in the future with climate change and things like that it can be sort of really like demobilizing for some people it's not just about mental health on a kind of a you know sitting here kind of panicking kind of sense it, it can stop you from actually doing productive political work as well so that kind of self-care kind of thing actually does feed back into collective action and you know uh, i think it's i think is it audrey lord who talked about survival pending revolution 
And so on all these different scales, you have certain gaps and certain problems in the left that can sort of be fulfilled with what I am happy and a lot of people cringe to call spirituality. But I think actually owning that is actually sort of, um, that's kind of a powerful move to sort of get people thinking about how do we navigate these kind of problems. Yeah, thank you, Graham. I'm really glad that you brought up Michael Brooks. I think there's a through line from the the work and legacy of Michael Brooks through K-Punk and through what some other people who are working within that tradition are attempting to actualize, whether we call it acid communism or what have you. One of the reasons that I decided to get into podcasting was Michael Brooks and the very spirit that he sort of brought to the left, which was this idea of a kind of spirituality, but not in the conventional sense. One of the figures that Michael Brooks attached himself to or, or brought up from time to time anyway was the psychologist James Hillman. And one of Hillman's famous mantras basically revolves around the idea that if we use something like psychoanalysis, for example, to adapt to this world, in some ways that's maladaptive. Like, why would we do that? Why would we use this discipline as a way to instrumentalize ourselves even further in the acceleration of the world? demise. And so he radicalized the discipline of psychoanalysis in a way that we could come to learn to live with images in a kind of ecology. And then in doing so that we would then transform that imaginal ecology and expand it outward into our relationships and into our politics and so forth. And Brooks, I think, was a, a key figure in that. And I mean, I lamented the fact that he died. It was very soon after or soon before us starting this podcast. So that was a great mention. Just to bring in a distinction between spirituality as many people typically reject it, in least in materialist circles, in terms of the ontological commitments that brings with it. It seems like you may be talking about spirituality as a mode of practicing the self, as a mode of experience, which doesn't necessarily have to bring in more ontological commitments, for example, a realm of spirits, a realm of a realm of mind, a realm of divinity on top of that as an Layer. I'm just wondering in terms of what for you would a spirituality that left could embrace, what would that entail metaphysically? Would it simply remain on the same level like Spinoza does of, of God or nature in the sense of, you know, it's just while extending substance and we're just seeing a new mode of it in which we can perceive ourselves in this more unified, holistic kind of way? Sure. Yeah. So the way that I see it is there are two sort of different things about the podcast, two different goals, I guess. On the one hand, there's leaving a certain space to be able to have dialogue with people who do have more sort of supernaturalistic beliefs and trying to get over this way, this sort of this approach to completely dismissing alternative metaphysics as though they are inherently reactionary. But at the same time, I, I do try and put forward what I think is and what would be acceptable to most people who think of themselves as having materialist sort of worldview and materialist politics. So metaphysics is, a, is one of the, the key aspects of it. But the way that I understand metaphysics is simply in the sense of there is a sort of an unseen structure to reality. It, there's something about the world that goes beyond perception and that will, will always go beyond perception. Like Levinas calls it the, uh, the desire for the invisible. As far as I'm concerned, with, with, with such a broad understanding of metaphysics, it doesn't necessitate any kind of supernatural realm. Even within, I don't actually like, um, use the term so much dialectical materialism. Uh, I have a little discussion of it on, on the podcast and how these, how these terms kind of relate to science. But it's not, they're not necessarily terms that I, I use. But you could retain actually a fairly sort of standard dialectical materialism, which talks about sort of the, the forces and the interrelations and the processes of the world that we cannot directly perceive. And something I say, I, I mentioned in the podcast, we cannot actually perceive capitalism of itself. We can see the effects of capitalism. We can see parts. We can see things happening in front of us. We can see things manifesting, but we can never actually see the whole. We can never actually really see the forces themselves. And it's not just a case of that with capitalism. It's the case of that with, with everything. There are always unseen structuring forces. We can always think in terms of process itself. One of the things that I think is most fruitful is the notion of potential or power, which I think is actually, it's not really talked about very much but i see it as kind of quite central to most sort of marxist materialism is there's always it, we don't just have an actual world that there's a media that we perceive but there are also things with powers you know class power labor power and things that aren't currently being actualized and when we sort of start to think in terms of powers suffusing through everything and i will admit although i don't actually really mention it there is a, De a sort of a Deleuzean sort of virtual that I'm kind of drawing on 
in my sort of the way that I think of it, it's not really Aristotelian, it's more Deleuzean. Once we start thinking in terms of the being an unseen, it's not a realm so much because it is, it's embodied in the actual world. But there is this unseen whole massive aspect or infinite aspect of even the, the immediately perceptible. And so I think you can start structuring a kind of a materialist spirituality around those kind of unseen but very material aspects of reality. Absolutely. I think you've hit on a crucial point when it comes to how we think about materialism. The thing is with materialism is that in a lot of rudimentary ways we talk about it, we are materialists in the fact we're not idealists. And there's a sort of hard rejection of ideas and ideality such that you think, and we're materialists, we deal with the hard, concrete, you know, this rock hard stuff you can hit and punch. But it's not really that, because materialism is fundamentally not simply about the given immediacies of an object, because capitalism, as Mark Fisher says in the post-capitalist society lectures, the totality is not given. What we need is the totality of their relations and the principle of their development. And that's that materialism is not particularly focused on the mere abstraction of immediate given matter. It is a logic of relations. This requires a kind of mysticism in which you go beyond the veil of immediacy, the veil of illusion in which things are simply given, you know, this thing here now, and it's all self-identical and incredibly rich all this sensuous potential. It is, in a sense, a higher sensuality. And this goes back to the full tradition of dialectical philosophy as it comes out with not, not only Hegel in terms of the raising towards absolute knowledge, which is the knowledge of dialectical process, but even, even as Mao developed this, not having much access to the Hegelian text, to my knowledge, but having the original dialectical philosophies of contradiction that you find in Taoism and elucidating even a really fascinating dialectical uh, thesis upon that. So I really think you've hit a good basis for both materialism and spirituality because materialism is not worker hit rock with hammer, which I think is a, dis a discursive trope which really needs to uh, go away at some point. And I think Fisher noticed this very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think um, this is where the concept of a body without organs actually comes in quite nicely. And I know this was a, a concept that was brought up in some of the K-punk materials that we looked at. And the way that I understand it in relation to the discussion we're having now is that all of our desires, all the flows that capital produce relate to this notion of capital as an abstraction, or in one of the ways that Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari put it, is this non-productive inorganic vitality, right? Which is this thing that we cannot penetrate, right? It is the ineffability of the Tao, that which cannot be named. And so there needs to be, thinking about it in these terms, you know, there's a way in which materialists need to come to terms with this notion of that which cannot be seen, that which cannot be grasped, that which cannot be sensed as that which organizes all that is seen, sensed, and grasped. I wonder, you know, when we talk about Mark Fisher's treatment of Spinoza and the sort of the notion of uh, the canatus and the relation it has to the body without organs, like if your work is an attempt to sort of bind leftist political intensities, organizations with an open field of spirituality, where does that leave you? Like, what are some of the difficulties you found constructing your own ethical framework when trying to take these two almost com like two totally ingraspable entities and then sort of put together like a coherent political ethics out of that, right? Because the, to me, that seems to be the grounding force of your work is an attempt to bind these two things together and then sort of move forward with with a, a political ethics in the Spinoza sense or in the Deleuzean sense, right, with anti-Oedipus and so on. So like, what are some challenges that you've had taking those two totalities forward? So I think one difficulty is if we try to sort of directly lead from one to the next, directly sort of simply start with, you know, a sort of a Marxist ontological framework and, and then try to derive some kind of spirituality out of it or vice versa, I think that can lead to certain problems. I mean, particularly as Marxism and, and well, just leftist sort of critique in general tends not to deal with the, to, to metaphysics per se, there's always a metaphysical aspect to it. But I tend to think of like Marxism, I, I refer to it as like a particular systems theory. It's not a general systems theory or a metaphysics, even though there are aspects to those. And I think you may, you, you really have a risk if you try to derive a spirituality out of something like Marxism. It's like, well, are we, you know, what is this, what is the world that we are turning into sort of the sacred are we do we risk worshiping capitalism basically is what i'm getting at or do we risk just worshiping the idea of communism and just turning it into sort of reifying it into some kind of 
there's that strange scene in Europa Europa, like where the children are sort of trying to be deprogrammed from their Orthodox, uh, the, the Russian Orthodox Church. And instead of praising God, they're sort of told to now praise Stalin. And the, they start shuffling, <laughs> shoving candy through the grates in the ceiling. And, and candy begins to fall on these four-year-olds so that they, they maintain those spiritual intensities, right? Because those are helpful in producing good docile workers. So they maintain all of those hierarchical demands of the Orthodox Church, but they just redirect them in a new in a new way. And there isn't exactly like this great liberating moment. Instead, it just sort of is this strange shift to the political. And what I like is you're forcing, I guess the best word for me would be like an interaction between these two things, rather than just one leading to the other. Um, it's mm. sort of going to try to force a collision, which I think is really cool. I think there's a... There's a... Perhaps, I don't know if there's a, a, a contentious point, but there's a similar problem I feel with the many sort of attempts and, and I think failures, I think it's generally accepted their failures, the attempts to bring together Marxism and psychoanalysis. I don't think that they're incompatible. I think the problem is trying to just take this system and this system and then mash them together. Whereas what, what I think needs to happen is you, you need to embed both into a wider sort of metaphysical or you know in, into a wider system that understands, is capable of dealing with both of them. It might require sort of you know tweaks here and there of certain aspects of them. And it's not to say that you're going to find some perfect harmony between them. I think the problem is trying to make you know just just to mash the two things together whereas creating a sort of a, a metaphysical bedding or or a general systems theory is one way to be able to sort of articulate these these often quite different sort of systems i wanted to know if there's a meaningful distinction between a materialist spirituality and a an ethics based in a kind of materialist spinozism because Mark Fisher himself has a lot of skepticism of the ways in which um, particularly sort of new age cultures and spiritualities are sort of repackaged and sold back to us under late capitalism as a kind of um, salve for the immiserating effects, sort of psychological effects that capitalism inflicts upon us. Is that a kind of ethics which builds upon Spinoza or you find in Spinoza or is it closer to something, 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 something new? So I'm determined to avoid what I'm doing being new, like a new age spirituality. That is absolutely essential. And some of the problems, new age spirituality, and they are, they are legion. One, for example, is the particular use of science in new age spirituality is typically a spiritual kind of perspective will be created or will just be pre-existing. And then little bits of sort of science, very broadly sort of understood, will be cherry picked to kind of support this pre-existing spiritual system. And they'll usually be completely distorted in the process. Another problem is the attempt to synthesize different religions. And I'm not completely dismissive of the idea of perennialism, that there is something that you can find, at least across the, the, the mystical and esoteric versions of world religions, that there is something coherent about them. I'm not opposed to that idea, but the the flattening of them into a singular kind of spirituality i think is is kind of problematic particularly if we're trying to use this as a means of you know creating dialogue or helping to enter into dialogue between a large number of different kind of communities and worldviews and so on we don't want to collapse them into some single totality and obviously a lot of new age spirituality is very liberal or even increasingly as we've seen over the past sort of couple of years it's become increasingly reactionary and you had this sort of like crossover of new age spiritualities and and q and and things like this there's a whole podcast i don't know if you've come across it called con spirituality that analyzes these crossovers of the far right or just general sort of reactionary opinion and new age spirituality so the way that i try to to avoid this is to begin from a scientific footing to begin from as rigorous a and contemporary a scientific sort of ontology as possible and using that as the sort of articulation between socialism and spirituality and trying to find points of contact between them. So I go into sort of things like complex systems theory, which is a, a sort of a later development of, of cybernetics, which is the kind of thing that Fisher was drawing on and which has had you know, quite a lot of impact on various strains of leftist thought and, and, and critical theory. So I, I use these kind of ideas and where they match up with a quite a lot of actually, you know, often quite sort of classical Marxist dialectical materialism. A lot of it actually coheres already quite nicely because it's about the processes and relations and systems and 
you know, holistic dynamics of things, the nesting of different systems and how they interrelate and how things emerge rather than a kind of a reductionistic science that only looks at parts and atoms and so on. And so with a kind of a a fairly sort of rigorous uh, scientific starting point, rather than just trying to pick and choose a little bit of, oh, a little bit of quantum mechanics here, and then, you know, we don't, we won't really understand anything about it. And we'll just say some nonsense about how it proves some kind of energy nonsense we're already talking about. It starts saying, well, no, we're going to, we're going to ground ourselves first in in something quite materialist and then say, well, you know, what are the sort of metaphysical implications of this? And then how can we construct, you know, what are the unseens and how can we construct something, you know, out of that? And to go to the the engagement with different religious worldviews and things, I think it's about finding points of contact rather than synthesizing. I think it's about looking at you know, Madhyamaka Buddhism or Taoism, looking at Islamic Sufism and trying to find moments where various kind of religious metaphysics may cross over and may enter into dialogue with the kind of thing that we are, well, the, the kind of thing I'm, I'm putting forward with this more sort of materialist starting point. And so in that, in that case, you maintain sort of like the autonomy of different sort of worldviews, but try to find means of them communicating with each other and then becoming mutually sort of, you know, developing through dialogue, through a sort of dialectic, rather than crushing everything into a singular kind of totality, which is what New Age sort of thought tends to do. To um, bring it back to Mark Fisher's work, it seems like for him, there's two key terms when it comes to the idea of materialist spirituality. And those are emotional engineering, as in the K-Punk piece, and uh, consciousness raising. And really, the two are entirely intertwined. But there is definitely a materialist basis in terms of uh, the Spinozism of Fisher when it comes to this idea of emotional engineering, because in the K-Punk piece, he references Antonio Damasio's work on Spinoza and neurology, particularly Damasio's theory of effective markers, these markers in the brain or structures in the brain it gives certain kinds of emotional weight to certain propositions or values or outcomes in cognitive reasoning. And there's a sense in which given the malleability of the Spinoza's colitus, the Spinoza's self, to be realigned in terms of its distribution of affects and dispositions, coupled with our contemporary theories of neuroplasticity, such as, you know, for example, Malibu, who's also worked on uh, Damasio. It seems like the material basis of this is aiming at this kind of emotional re-engineering of the self, this production of selves, this seizing, in a sense, of the means of self-production. And this is what a lot of religious traditions, including mystical traditions, have always worked towards. Particularly even 20th century Britain, you have people like Austin Osman Speer, doing the notions of sigil magic on the idea of taking a sigil, taking a symbol, reducing a desire to a particular image, and then attempting to implant it in the subconscious to produce a certain motivational outcome, such it becomes more weighted in your everyday actions. Or you have the very postmodern kind of magic of the chaos magicians who utilize Oslo's and spare stuff, as well as lots of influences from cybernetic imagery to further their own emotional reconfiguration. And you can sort of really see how this could actually be made more palatable to the hard-nosed materialist mindset through scientific developments or even still ongoing. Yeah, and that sort of, that idea of emotional engineering as sort of looking in at ourselves, our bodies as a system that we can intervene into and affect. I can, so I, I think I can link this back into a question I'm not sure I answered about what would be the distinction between like a Spinozist ethics that doesn't emphasize spirituality and, and what I'm putting forward. Because this is, you know, Spinoza is, has become more popular on the left over the last sort of few decades, but the, the reading of, of him tends to be either as effectively an atheist or even as literally a, a closet atheist who was hiding his atheism behind a discourse of, you know, of religion just so he, he wouldn't be persecuted. That clearly didn't work if that was what he was trying to do because he was still persecuted. But I believe, and, and Mark Fisher argues the same, and a number of contemporary Spinoza scholars argue the same, that no, we have to see him as a theological thinker, as someone who was maybe a religious reformer, we might think of, that he, he definitely thought in terms of a you know a rationalist religion, but we really have to take seriously the idea of, of religion in Spinoza. And for me, what is really important in that notion of Deus sive natura, God or nature, is that people who want to read Spinoza as as a secular thinker or as an atheist think that, oh, well, if we're saying God or nature, then we may as well just think of nature because clearly they're the same thing. But something I draw on in the podcast is this idea that oh, that's just not how language works. 
language is not just a descriptor. It, does, it doesn't just link us into dictionary definitions. Different words have different affective impacts. This will differ between different people, different communities and different parts of the world. But for me, even though I have been, you know, an atheist now for, well, it's questionable now, but <laughs> throughout most of my life, I was an atheist. Um, but I still grew up in a Christian context. You might, even if you want to call it a post-Christian society, I had... Uh, at least one Christian parent, you know, we sang hymns in school. I've read the Bible in various different permutations. I'm aware of all these biblical stories. All of these 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 symbols have an effective power. They mean something to me. When someone says nature and when someone says God, even if I know they're defining them on a very sort of brute kind of way, you know, they're, they're referring in some purely denotational kind of logical way to the same thing, they don't have the same impact. And they don't link into the same feelings, the same practices, the same communities, the same discourses. And so even if you wanted to think of it in this really coldly rationalistic way, which I, I'm not actually, I'm not actually quite what I'm doing, but I think even if you wanted to be this coldly rationalist, you could say, well, we're just going to use these more, this more spiritual language because that has a different effect on us. And it, you know, it, if it makes me feel good to call nature God, then I'm going to call it God and I'm not going to call it nature, even just on that, that absolutely basic sort of level. And I think and this is something that uh, Mark mentioned something, he, he mentioned something only very briefly, he doesn't go into a lot of detail about it, but he, he mentions about if we wanted to turn this into, into sort of collective practice, into an actual practice religion and not just something we're thinking about, we would need some notion of like collective devotion. And he uses that word, which is a very sort of, you know, religious word. And I think that's kind of, we have to kind of take that seriously in Spinoza's work. You can't just swap the language in for something else. While you're on that, a second ago, you were talking about how it's not necessarily the fact that we need to sort of dress all of these things up in, you know, spiritual language. But even if that is all we did, you believe that there would be some sort of political efficaciousness to that move. And I'm wondering if at all you can speak to, because we're all coming to this discussion with the assumption that the left's atheism is what holds it back, or is something that that is a sort of perpetual problem since, let's just say, like the October Revolution or something, and uh, frankly, even Jacobinism too, right? So I was wondering if you could speak to any sort of uh, acute moments where recently you've seen as a political observer, this problem manifest and be a, a sort of part of the death knell of any particular swelling up or interest in a, in a more left-wing future? I guess it depends on, you know, I talked about these different scales at which there is, you know, the potential for some sort of like spiritual intervention. On the scale of sort of general propaganda, it's difficult to, it's difficult to say, you know, here is an example of where something didn't work because we just generally aren't working and it's, it can be difficult to sort of like highlight exactly when something doesn't work. I think it's more interesting to more not interesting but to see the other side when does some when something does work. And you do actually get snippets of this. I've noticed more so in American like social democratic politics than in the British. I think possibly because it's a more generally a more religious society, but you do occasionally see these moments of like verging on the discourse of like liberation theology. People I've heard people like Alexandra Ocasio Cortez sort of start slipping into what sounds like a kind of a, a liberation theology. And you, I always notice it really like it takes off. People really kind of respond to it a lot. And even just, even if you just look at, and it's not necessarily what you call spiritual, but the kind of discourse that you've got with, with someone like Jeremy Corbyn, you know, he, I, I, I'm not sure he might actually be a practicing Christian. I'm not entirely sure, but he certainly wasn't, you know, propagandizing through a sort of a spiritual mode, I don't think. But certainly a more, a more kind of focus on the heart, if you will. Um, what sort of, um, I think it was, I think it was Ernst Bloch talked about the warm stream of Marxism. It's, it's more about sort of getting beyond the pure sort of like numbers and rationalism and well, they're sort of not getting beyond the, you know, you can, it, it could include a Spinozist rationalism, but you know, the kind of the typical understanding of rationalism of logic and numbers and that the left often tends towards. I totally see what, what you mean within like a, a, a sort of conventional political 
liberal electoral framework, right? Where it's not even spirituality, like one's alignment with a particular institution becomes really important, right? Uh, let's say in the United States, uh, until, you know, 2016, there was sort of this requirement that an individual needed to feign some sort of alignment with sort of new age evangelism, uh, or else that particular candidate in that hyper conservative environment wouldn't work. I'm wondering if like, this is a problem facing other, uh, not directly uh, institutionally political movements, um, you know, like, is this a problem? Do you see in like spaces where the black block will manifest or something like that, where th this becomes a, um, a space for, for conflict? And I, I, I wonder what would happen if uh, we took up this desire to open the spiritual field and allow for an analysis to take seriously the importance of the spirituality of individuals involved in the movements, particularly considering just how draining it is to constantly be engaged in these, in these struggles and then be told perpetually that the only thing that matters is one's ability to engage with a very particular set definition of like material conditions, right? That, I think that there, there needs to be another layer of political exhaustion, political burnout that comes down to to the assumption that the spiritual wellness of a worker, of a member of the lumpen, right, that that doesn't matter. Instead, you know, it's these five or six markers that we've held since 1841 um, as legitimate. And then everything else about, about it is just a symptom and can be reduced to, to the problems of modernity. Just as a, a slight quip, I guess, the problem as well in terms of burnout in the absence of spirituality or religion, because for example, take the example of Christianity. At least there's one day set aside where you don't have to do this shit all the time. <laughs> and there's a sense of this, the big other, you know, it becomes more pervasive in the absence of God because the conditions are always so immediate. On the, the, the question of have I seen it cause conflict, I, I, I recall, I didn't actually, I didn't see it with my own eyes. I was outside at the time, but I recall that at an anarchist book fair a few years ago, um, a very large... There was a bit. Of, there was a bit of a, a, a fight around, you know, the anarchist sort of no gods, no masters sort of thing being taken quite literally, and there being. In fact, I think it was something a bit more directly offensive to religious people. And there was sort of a, a Muslim anarchist, and you know, there was. I, d I don't know if there was a punch up sense, but like the, I mean, a metaphorical punch up. And this is, you know, the kind of the kind of thing that can increasingly happen. I think as 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 the left becomes actually, you know. I mean, let's let's be perfectly honest. The the left can tend to be, particularly in in Britain, can be, tend to be very white dominated. Very, at least, I don't know quite what it's like organising in in America. And obviously, huge country. I'm sure very different contexts. Yeah, <laughs> and it's you know, there's Christianity does not have uh, that much of a, an active force here. But when you're trying to organise in in a way and and that you're breaking down that dominance of, of whiteness you're going to be entering you know bring, bringing uh, or people allowing people in stop stopping blocking people let's say um who are coming from communities that are more likely to be religious they're more likely to be christian and muslim and that is i mean i mean ask like trying to find examples where it's actively created conflict is is prob is is difficult because often people are just they're not coming into spaces at all because they already know that people are going to be a dick about religion. So the conflict doesn't even really happen. It's invisible because you've already pushed people away. And on, uh, we mentioned something, something about the spiritual health of workers. And this is, a, this is another thing that I think is, is a good reason to engage with spirituality is actually because capitalism already is. Capitalism is already trying to fill that gap constantly. And the left is letting it. And this is why we, you know, we, we see, you know, whenever you hear about like workplace mindfulness and all this kind of crap, they are filling a gap that we are not even engaging with. Yeah, the Amazon well-being box, right? Exactly, exactly. The horrors of that. And we can, you know, the, the, the tendency, and it was right to, to critique that kind of thing, but the tendency seems to be to just critique it and say, oh, look, mindfulness used to pacify workers, removed of, of any kind of radical content it might have, it's just a liberal thing. 
great i agree with that that um mm. that critique but it's like well why aren't we providing something that fulfills the same function but develops people's consciousness towards a more sort of you know revolutionary consciousness in a sense it reminds me of you know we recently covered the agamben essay what is an apparatus and he basically argues that it's naive equally to think that we can redirect these these apparatuses in a particular way but it's it's naive as well to think that we can just simply destroy them and that that will be enough. Instead, he he takes forward this position of having to sort of sprout up these momentary counter apparatuses that allow for sort of an intervention in these broader systems of domination. So you're right. You can't simply just uh, critique both and do nothing. Instead, there needs to be these moments of resistance, of, of alternatives, <laughs> um, and I, I think that the, the 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 Amazon well-being box is an interesting one because so many of it was just like, look at how dystopian this is. I'm like, yeah, it is really. All right. Well, what now? <laughs> you know? I could say one one little thing about that because that links back because briefly asked, asked me about like other work I, I've done. And my first book, Shock Doctrine of the Left, was more sort of based on thinking about strategy. It's still based on the same kind of scientific ontology, but there's a very similar point to what you just said about Agamben was talking about there. Is I try to think in terms of instead of thinking of you know what is the left's strategy, try to think of there are different functions and different parts of the left can fulfill different functions. And as long as they're sort of like interacting and like, you know, developing in tandem, they can actually be doing very different things because they're fulfilling different functions. And so I sort of I take these from Eric Olin Wright and then kind of mash them about so they're mm. actually quite different. Mm. But I talk about smashing, building, healing and taming. And so, you know, we can't just think about any one of these like smashing any particular sort of system or organization or institution or anything like that, because then you just create a system, you just create chaos, basically, and then things will develop based on what the initial conditions of that chaos are. They can go into any sort of direction. They could then be reabsorbed into something even worse. So at the very least, we need to be mixing our, our attempts to smash things with our attempts to build things, you know, as many anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists have talked about, you know, building the new world in the shell of the old and prefigurative pra practices is about sort of like laying the foundations for what comes afterwards obviously there's a question of often those things are very small scale and how do you scale them onto a onto a to a, to a, to a wider scale but nonetheless the the um the principle is the same it's like we cannot just smash we also have to create something else and we also have to have processes to make sure that it, this doesn't destroy people's minds and their bodies and we also have to deal with what are the things that we know we can't smash or maybe don't want to smash but still want to change and so there are all these different functions that are often taken as, you know, being at loggerheads with one, one another, but actually it's more about trying to find the frameworks that we can understand them working together and get them sort of in dialogue. Now, I haven't brought that into the into the podcast yet, but I am planning in sort of reweaving that kind of idea into, into the podcast and the book towards the end and sort of thinking of this, because in the first book, it was very much about on the broad sort of movement strategy level. But I, I sort of take it as a kind of an ontology of change in systems, and I'm sort of going to try and weave it back into thinking in terms of consciousness change as well. Like how do we smash and build and he he heal and tame on these sort of different levels of our, both of ourselves, our interrelations, you know, our, our communities on the, all these different scales. The question that I had for you, Graham, is I, I was just thinking in terms of, okay, what's a, what's a sort of brute objection to your view or someone like you who holds a similar view and I'll double down on the no gods, no masters thing just for a second and, and think in terms of somebody who says something like, look, look at these religions. I mean, basically, they are technologies of capture. Um, these are things that recapitulate the logic of domination, the logic of capitalism in some sense, and they find their place in this broader mechanism that keeps people down. Why should I you know, engage with that? Like, how, how do we do so without reinstalling the logic of those systems into the new? Yeah, so that's, you know, there's there's a sort of a typical sort of critique of, of religion on the left that it is innately tied into domination. And you can't get away from the fact that it, it is, it has been and does continue to be used in that kind of way. But I think if we, if we actually try to have kind of like a, a sociological kind of view of religion as it is actually practiced and manifested in the world, we can see plenty of examples of that completely contradict that, like the various liberation theology movements, mm. which 
which were not small, they had a huge impact on 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 a huge wave of, of left wing movements across South America that brought lots of you know left governments into power. There were you know even even whilst you know you had the classical critiques of, of religion as being in, you know inherently reactionary and um, you know. In, in, during like the Russian Revolution, you also had a huge number of Christian communists who were taking part in these revolutions. Even, even I mean, the effects of them weren't necessarily, you know, emancipatory in a way that we would think of it now, is sort of a socialist sense. But you know, back into the Middle Ages and looking at the various peasant wars, which were often fueled by people's millenarian sort of Christian belief in the coming apocalypse. And they, that wasn't a thing which kept them down. This was a thing which was used as a means of actually fighting against the dominant powers. Now, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, that there weren't going to be problems with these kind of, they didn't have their own kind of oppressive dynamics of their of their own. But nonetheless, I think it's, it's a huge reduction to simply see religion in terms of domination. Yeah, I think I'll follow that up with, well, that then raises the question of, what is specifically lacking in terms of maybe a positive political program or a positive spiritual program for the left. I guess what I want to know is like, where do your commitments lie in terms of actualizing particular growth areas? I guess, I mean, very early in the podcast, you alluded to the fact that, you know, there's this challenge amongst people of various tendencies to even communicate with one another. And then Amidst thinking about how religion is so diverse and, you know, even within specific traditions, there are various sects and what have you, the priorities of any given religion may differ greatly from another ones, you know, like, are we going to uphold a Bacchanalian feast? Or are we going for some sort of Heideggerian reticence? What is it that the left needs to develop? Like, what do you think is lacking? Where is that space, that thing, that node that we need to grow? The hard hitting questions. Yeah, it's quite a, <laughs> quite a broad. Okay, think having to think quite broadly about this one. So it's difficult because I don't want to prescribe specific practices. I don't want to be like to to sort of get to a sort of point and be like, oh well, everyone has to meditate. It, that could be one one way that you you know actualize these kind of ideas. And I should say, I I did actually run a radical mindfulness group in London for a couple of years. Uh, right. It was actually, it was experimental, but it was actually quite successful. A couple of people who came along, it was quite a, a, a really good variety of people. There were sort of like trade union activists and like people who sort of like studied like critical theory and post-structuralism and stuff. And it was a, a good mix of sort of like of activists and academics. And the, the, the more sort of academically minded people sort of said was they they found it really interesting because they there were lots of things that they had studied, lots of modes of thinking that they had studied, but they'd never actually really embodied it. And they never really found it, like felt it. You know, they, they might have been thinking about how, oh, there's no essences to to things and how we're just all these processes and blah, 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 blah. But actually sitting down and actually using sort of embodied contemplative practices as a way of feeling that kind of thing was an entirely new sort of process and they found it actually it then played back on their sort of you know their their rationalizing of those ideas and it changed and it got them thinking in new ways so maybe one way of like i said it's a broad question maybe one broad way of answering that is saying use our bodies more engage the body in an experiment with it uh, i don't necessarily mean you could be but i'm not necessarily saying you know hang yourself from hooks from the ceiling but you could do that if that if if you think that is going to you know advance your consciousness <laughs> in a new way but it's more about like opening up new possibilities by trying new things and not just as individually but in in collectives because there is there is I can't really answer it because if I knew I would be getting people to do it already and this was one of the things with the the London radical mindfulness group is it was an experiment because I had never found another group doing that kind of thing and it was about sort of testing out and seeing where it kind of took us. Yeah, it's interesting because from a political standpoint, I mean, in my years doing this stuff and observing people, you see people take flight from organizing spaces to things like doing yoga or doing Zen meditation or what have you, as if that were the place of repose. And then what makes this the activist space? What kind of space is that? And it seems that there has been a challenge to, you know, effectuate a merger of those sorts of things. And in some ways, I would say the kind of centrist discourse, and maybe even somewhat on the right, has had more success 
in in terms of capturing discourses around things like stoicism, for example, or meditation, and sort of loosely aligning it with those politics too. And uh, I mean, I, I have to say, you know, despite this sort of devil's advocate or devil's podcaster objections that, that I put forward, I'm kind of with you on that point. So I guess my follow up to that is how do we go about capturing or taking that back from the Jordan Petersons of the world or those who are doing like the Stoic convention every year. And it's interesting in something like Stoicism, as an aside, in the Stoic tradition, one of the pillars of that tradition was to be engaged in a kind of politics and ethics. How does something like that work on the left is uh, something that I've wondered. I'm glad you mentioned Jordan Peterson because he's actually one of the the, the main sort of, maybe not influences probably isn't the word, but instigators maybe the right has got much better at integrating what you might call sort of spiritual kind of approaches with their politics and and a whole whole array of 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 different discourses um there's much more with someone like jordan peterson there's much more of a sense that he's putting forward a holistic worldview that allows people to think about and talk about and do stuff in terms of spirituality and self-help and thinking in terms of art and science and politics as though they are one thing. He puts forward this very sort of very broad worldview. And that's one of the reasons why I, I think this return to, to metaphysics as the base of, of what, we're, what we're doing and thinking is really important because we can then nest within that. Yes, we can, act, we can bring in our, you know, our, our, our Marxist kind of materialism. We can talk about spirituality, but we can also talk about art. We can talk about all sorts of different things within that framework. So I think that is one of the one of the ways to it to, and I think it's, that makes that makes much more attractive you, when you when you're able to talk about art. Like I, I'm not against critique of art uh, in terms of you know the effects of capitalism on the production of art. I think we absolutely need to have those critiques. I think we need we, there does need to be you know spaces where we're engaging uh, at the imbrication of various different sort of things and capitalism. But sometimes you want to just talk about art and sometimes you just want to talk about the body. You sometimes you don't want to talk about your family and relationships. And yes, we also need to talk about the, you know, social reproduction, capitalism, capturing the, the family in terms of the production of new workers. But sometimes you just want to bitch about your sibling and your mom and dad or whatever. And, and but having a way of connecting that into everything else we're doing through a holistic worldview is something that the right has got very good at doing, something the left is very bad at doing. Yeah, the discourse can be a prison. So we need we need a break now and again. <laughs> Adam, you got something? <laughs> I just wanted to sort of proffer, because I do a lot of work in terms of the particular leftist kinds of uh, taking on aspects of religion. And I'm a very big believer in the, the Hegelian thesis that you can't have a revolution of our reformation i've been thinking the entire podcast about what can the left take from religion and i think really the best thing to take out of this is a mixture of ecstasy in terms of the original greek term of getting out of oneself in a sort of dionysian sense back in alien sense and communion at the same time in which you get out of yourself in a way that reaches into the other and binds you with them as a community and in a sense when we're taking on this emotional re-engineering what we are trying to get in a sort of left of spirituality is to form a community on the principle of a certain mode of communal ecstasy of getting out of oneself and reaching out to other people and it, it feels like there are certain models we could look for. Traditionally, there have been some letters attempts in the 20, early 20th century, for example, um, the Asafal secret society to build on some of the back and alien stuff. We've got some amazing Christian atheist readings of, of Hegel coming up, people like Slavoj Zizek, among others, uh, Todd McGowan, for example, and Catherine Malibu. And quite like, you see, you have, we, still have, we still have some examples of this, though, because I mean, even in terms of the, the flattening out of essentialist kinds of hierarchy, we have the priest on top and the lay people at the bottom. As, yeah, the Quakers, they produced Richard Nixon. But apart from that, it's an incredibly <laughs> anarchic mode of, of Christian worship. It's a gathering about in silence. And then in, if, you, if you need to speak, you can speak your piece. And then you can shake hands with everyone else as a completely flattened, uh, non-hierarchical way as a mode of practice. And then be gone. It's, it's built up, not simply on scripture, but essentially really only on the, the history of that practice. Now, I'm wondering what the left can build up from these traditions. I mean, even from the more revolutionary traditions of the, as you mentioned, the German Peasants' War, Thomas Münzer, Omnia Sunt Communia in, in Altstadt. And it really feels like we lack the ability to reform ourselves into revolutionary characters. And then through what many people would see as the, the bad parts of religion, which is the priesthood of 
the Marxist Leninists, and the, the myth, which is, you know, nothing happened in Kronstadt and uh, everything was fine. And um, um, uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was that, it was that Pizza Hut advert, actually, that did it. Um, that's very um, and it's we also <laughs> It's very easy to revert to in trying to flee from religion's this harsh materialist ethic into this kind of mythology of socialism. I think we need to bring back this idea of ecstasy, communion, getting out of the, the hard-heartedness of our, of our original so-called materialist positions. I think it's maybe something we could work on. It's um, interesting you mentioned the Quakers. I, I, I might be a, a wrong on this, so this might be something for people to go away and have a, have a Google of, but I'm fairly sure that... Actually, quite a lot of I've read that quite a lot of core organizing, sort of non hierarchical organizing techniques that are used in a lot of leftist spaces around sort of like facilitation have actually were actually literally derived from Quakerism and from the practices of of um, uh, communal worship. Yeah, it would not surprise me at all. Not it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. It's, it's, yeah. Incredibly decentralized um, yeah. notion of, of worship. So yeah, there are there are occasionally uh, moments of like pure sort of like organizing that can that can be learnt from. As well as I think the the thing for me is, and this this kind of maybe ties into the two the two sort of parts of your question is the role of the body. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but it's the way that I define spirituality the body is a really important aspect of that you know when people think about religion they often think in terms of beliefs doctrines texts and things like this but the most maybe maybe it's a stretch to say the most important but a hugely important thing that you cannot leave out to really understand how religion functions is the role of the body both in the sense of how people feel it, it, what, you know, what religion actually does to them and then what they do through their practices, through their, their rituals, through how they present themselves in dress, where they go, what they do, their whole sense of being a community, their, their identity, all of those things are central to religion. And I think if you stop understanding people who believe as people who identify, you make all sorts of like Dawkins-esque mistakes thinking that people have just sort of like rationalized themselves into this into this corner and you can unrationalize them by arguing against against the sort of the logic of their belief in god and you just can't because fundamentally logic um religion is much more about belonging it more tends to be and once you start thinking about the body and i think that you know i the, basically the way i define spirituality is is the interrelation between metaphysics ethics and embodiment that's how how I can sort of like define spirituality in a way which is you know fits neatly with a kind of you know a materialist spirituality. It's not just enough to have a metaphysical sort of worldview, a system, a you know a sort of a logic. It's not even enough to use that to inform what you think is right and wrong, good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, or what whichever way you want to think about ethics. It also has to be embodied. You have to have some feeling about it. It has to you has to create some kind of emotion in you and then you have to do something with your body or you have to or maybe 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 not say with your body because i don't want to exclude people who you know maybe aren't mobile but to do something that affects the world um that affects bodies and those two aspects you mentioned of ecstasy and communal practice are basically um i sort of see them as basically the internal and external you may even think of them as the esoteric and exoteric aspects of of the body and its spirituality you know not all spiritual experience is ecstatic in that kind of intense sense but that's obviously a, you know a kind of an ideal you know we, we we want to have ecstatic experiences they might sometimes be a bit duller than that but as in, to some extent they, there needs to be a feeling we can't just believe that there's some outside we, we have to have mm. some affective sort of relation to it and then yeah actually getting together with people and doing things um is also the, the the point at which you know when we start thinking about bodies that practice things and do things that's the point at which you, you can say well you know our, our communal embodied practice of religion could simply be being a, in a room and you know doing some sort of rituals but embodied practice is also doing political stuff it's also organizing and these kind of things and that's the, oh, oh they're all embodied practices and that's the point at which they can sort of like cross over but we also don't need to dichotomize between political and traditionally religious because basically i i think anything that you do with your body any anything 
can take on a spiritual dimension. You know, when people talk about having religious experiences when they're in a club or, you know, when they're having sex or or, there's all sorts of moments that you can have what feels like a religious experience. And I want to take that seriously. I want to say that those are, those are maybe say spiritual experiences. Um, There are moments when, even if, even if only momentarily, and even if only on a sort of a low level that you haven't maybe rationalized, you have sort of seen beyond the immediate. You may, you've maybe seen your power, the, you know, the, or the power of you as a collectivity, as a, as a sports team. You've sort of seen potentials and you've realized them and you've, and it's tipped you over the edge into, into a sort of a feeling of having been taken out of normality. And for a moment, it's given you a sense of like what you should be doing and what the world is, you know, what is good in the world. And, and you felt something really intense. Now, obviously, those kind of experiences tend to be momentary. They tend to not have very much sort of political valence to them. But I see them as like they're not fundamentally different to a religious experience and they're not fundamentally different to what I'm arguing for it as like sort of a political kind of joy. They're just sort of like different moments that can, can be directed uh, into a more sort of like a political direction.